The wrecks of the Arkendale and Wasdale H still lie in the River Severn, a haunting reminder of the tragedy that befell them in 1960. Slowly they slipped out and they got caught up with the tidal wrecks. Chris Witts was a 16-year-old deckhand on one of the sister ships that night as the two barges got trapped in the tide. We swept them up to the bridge. Both skippers fighting to break apart and also to get themselves facing back towards Sharpness. They couldn't, they were going up sideways up the river and suddenly they hit the bridge. There was this great woomph. And we looked in the direction of the, the bang, which was up, up river, and then there was this great big orange glow. Part of the bridge collapsed and five crewmen died. Percy Simmons, Robert Niblett, Jack Dudfield, Alex Bullock, and 17-year-old deckhand Malcolm Hart. Just three men survived. She seemed to go right over on her beam ends straight away. Did you jump in the water then? Then I thought, better drown than burn. Well, I should like to thank the staff and everyone concerned in the rescue of us. And amongst all that blazing oil in a small rowing boat, they could have easily found themselves in the same position as we were. I could see this orange glow over on top of the fog. Terry Parsons has lived in Sharpness Docks most of his life. He saw the explosion as he was decorating his daughter's bedroom. Next day, we see the two tankers locked together way above the Sever Bridge on the sandbanks, and they were still burning quite badly then. That night and that day will always be with me. As this archive footage shows, the bridge was once a busy transport route in and out of the Forest of Dean. After the accident, that was cut off when it was demolished. But 60 years on, the wrecks remain. Now, when I see the wrecks, I start to get or feel quite emotional. And I sometimes do it at home when I'm sat there thinking, and you sometimes feel this emotional feeling. And at low tide, the wrecks emerge as a memorial not just to the tragedy, but to the five men who lost their lives. Steve Nibbs, BBC Points West, Sharpness. On that fateful day, the 25th of October 1960, I was uh, a deckhand on a small tanker barge called the Wasdale H. And we had left Gloucester about six o'clock that morning, together with the Wasdale H, uh, our sister vessel, and we were bound for Avonmouth Docks, which is down the bottom of the Severn Estuary here. And um, we got down to Sharpness three hours later, locked out into the Severn, and got down to Avonmouth uh, late that morning, up into the big sea lock, up into the docks, to the oil dock, loaded a cargo of uh, petrol. Both of us loaded the same cargo. And um, waited then for the night tide. Seven o'clock came. And that's when we uh, left our berth and to go back into Avonmouth Lock and up the Severn Estuary. Well, when we left Avonmouth about seven o'clock that evening, um, it was a still night and fairly clear. A bit of mist around, not too bad. And uh, to be honest, I worked with an unhappy crew. And to keep out their way, being a lad of 16, I went down into the accommodation. I made them a hot cup of tea, took it to them, and then I vanished, kept out of the way. But two hours later, there was a frantic ringing of the bell in the accommodation, which was a signal for me to go on deck and see what the skipper wanted. And as I went on deck, I was in this thick pea soup of fog. Couldn't see your hand in front of your face. And I'd only been with the company a month, so it was all new to me, but that was the first fog I'd been in out on the water. And this uh, horrible experience. Skipper yells to me, get the mate and get up on the bow and listen for the foghorn off Sharpness. Um, because we had no radar, the only guide we had was the foghorn and um, a bit of good luck uh, to find your way in between the piers into Sharpness docks. But obviously you, your vessel was lucky, your sister vessel not so lucky. Tell us what happened. Well, to get into Sharpness docks is very difficult. It's not a question of coming up the river and harding the wheel over the starboard and going in between the piers. You'd be swept away if you did that. You have to come up the river. And bear in mind, we are basically underpowered with the engines. They're not that powerful. And the tide sometimes is stronger than the vessel's engines. So half a mile below sharpness docks in those days, you would swing around, punch the tide facing the way you've come to punch against that incoming tide, 
drop yourself back very slowly until you're abreast of the entrance to Sharpness Docks, and then peel off and go in uh, using the tide to take you in. Very difficult. Well, you imagine that on a thick, foggy night, and you can't see anything, and the skippers in the wheelhouse have got to somehow find that entrance. Well, that night, I'm up on the bow with the mate, and suddenly, out of the fog, loomed our sister vessel, the Wasdale H. And she hit us, not too hard, bounced off. The young lad was on the bow, my equivalent, the deckhand, Markham Hart. I shouted to Markham, you okay, Markham? See you in the morning. And that's the last I saw him, because they went off into the fog and were involved in the disaster. So tell us about the disaster itself then, Chris. What, what happened between the two vessels? Well, in front of us that night, because we had this 13 vessels coming up the estuary in a convoy. One of the first ones was the Arkindale H, which was carrying black oil that had come up from Swansea. And skipper George Thompson, and as he had swung around and dropped back to go in between the piers, he suddenly met a tug towing lighters. It was in his way. He took the power off his engine and the tide brought him up to where we are now, to what is called the old dock entrance at Sharpness and he found himself in some slack water and held himself there with a plan in his head. And then out of the fog came our sister vessel, the Wastel H, after she had hit us. She came up, she had lost her way into the entrance, but George saw the Wastel and shouts to the skipper, Jimmy Jew, Jimmy, do you know where you are? Because Jimmy was a new skipper to the vessel and to the company. Jimmy, do you know where you are? And Jimmy said, yes, and George said, lie alongside me, and when it's high water, we'll calmly go down and in the docks. Because, to be fair, vessels have missed that dock entrance quite a few times in the past. So this wasn't unusual? No, 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 no. Um, and vessels had actually gone on up and gone through the piers of the bridge. Then, of course, they're going up with the tide, tide turns, and they come back down on the ebb tide, don't say anything to anyone. This happens. But that night, sadly, those two vessels were lying alongside here and slowly they slipped out and they got caught up with the tidal race, which swept them up to the bridge. Both skippers fighting to break apart and also to get themselves facing back towards Sharpness. They couldn't, they were going up sideways up the river and suddenly they hit the bridge. Again, that night when we're swinging off the uh, piers at Sharpness in this thick fog, um, it's eerie out on the river in thick fog because you, you don't hear anything. You, all you hear is this lap of water and that's all the sound you've got. You can't see anything, there's no bearings or anything. And suddenly there was this great whoomph. And we looked in the direction of the, the bang, which was up, up river, and then there was this great big orange glow and it burnt off the fog up there. And um, at that point also, we found the entrance to Sharpness Docks and the skipper took her into the docks. And me being this young 16 year old with a company just for the month, I was so naive that they allowed us to tie up in the main dock basin because normally we would tie just by where we are now in the uh, bar jar. But that night said, no, you all tie up in the main dock. Um, I cleaned the vessel up, took me 10 minutes, and I turned in because uh, the accommodation was superb. I had my own cabin, nice warm cabin, nice bunk. I turned in and slept through the night. So and all this was going on. Did, did, I mean, despite this explosion, did they know what had happened or were they just trying to keep you out of it? Or? No, no. Um, we knew they were working on the bridge. With, there was oxyacetylene cylinders on the bridge because workmen were doing, had been working on it for a while. We simply thought it was uh, a workman had blown up one of the cylinders. Didn't have, a, didn't have no thought of uh, two tangers up there. Obviously, after I turned and went to sleep, the others who hadn't turned into their bunk would soon know what was going on up there. Um, mayhem. Yeah. The next morning, though, when you when you woke up and did you get involved in anything, or did you did you just head back to Gloucester and? We left. We left as normal about six in the morning, bound for Gloucester because we had a load bound, we were going on up to Worcester, you see. And uh, as we went up the canal, 
past where the wrecks were and the damaged bridge, uh, you could see the wrecks smouldering out in the, in the river. Nothing was said. <laughs> and my parents at home that morning had listened to the BBC 7 o'clock news on the radio, heard about the disaster, jumped in the car, went down to Gloucester Lock, stopped at Gloucester Lock and said to the lock keeper, uh, that disaster at Sharp Ness, that's right. What vessel was your son on? He was on the Wisedale H. Oh, well, I'm ever so sorry, but uh, they've all been killed off the Wisedale. <laughs> you, you can imagine what state they were in. So they, they drove the extra half mile to the John Harker's office down Monk Meadow Dock at Gloucester. Saw the manager and the manager said, nope, he's safe and sound, he's on his way up the canal. And the company very kindly gave us the rest of the day off. We didn't go to Worcester till next day. Well now, uh, especially when I see the wrecks, and I'm still up far up the canal to see the wrecks, I, I start to get, or feel, quite emotional. It's, and I sometimes do it at home when I'm sat there thinking, and you sometimes feel this emotional feeling. Now, I can recall that George Thompson, who then became my skipper after that, and I worked with George for a number of years. I stayed friends right until he died when he was in his 80s. And George told that story to me regularly but towards the end, he used to break down and cry. And I can see today why he did that, because I think it's an age thing when you get older and you reflect on life, you realise that it could have been you. And he was the only one that went back to the business. He, yeah. He, yeah, so he, he was yeah. brave enough in many ways to go back, because the others didn't feel they could do that. George was a very, very strong man. He was physically strong, because he was an amateur boxer, and he was also mentally strong. He didn't suffer falls gladly, you didn't mess with George. And sadly, George was a bit of a Jonah and he was involved in other accidents. I with him, and um, before I met George, other accidents he was involved with. But how did it affect everybody in the, you know, the sort of coming weeks, months and years after it happened? Everybody within the industry here that were, that were doing the journey and obviously things changed because the bridge wasn't here yeah. anymore, but... A lot of men left the company because of it. Uh, and the job was dangerous anyway without that accident and even a few months later one of the uh, what we call the shell boats similar size to the tanker barges the harker barges but crewed by harker men and operated by john harker six seven of these um, shell boats one of them turned over down yesterday in the february of 1961 and all five men killed on that one um, very dangerous job that's because, as we were saying before we started filming, you know, this is a dangerous river, isn't it? You know, a lot of people say this is, this, this is the, the one river in the whole of the UK you've got to treat with respect. Most dangerous river in the UK. It is. It's, um, when, there's, when the tide's out and you try to walk on the mud, you get stuck in the mud. If you're out there when the river is flowing fast, whether it's coming in or the tides is ebbing out, it's still very dangerous. You get it wrong, there's no second chance.